Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. Good evening. Peace be with you. In a few minutes, uh, 10 minutes, right? We have 10 minutes. I will try to summarize the faith of Islam. <laughs> Can you imagine 10 minutes? So basically, um, just a few things uh, to say. When we say Islam, um, five pillars of Islam comes to our mind. Um, to believe in one God, there is only one God. Uh, to um, five to have five daily prayers to pray five times a day uh, to um, fast in the month of Ramadan it's a one month fasting um, uh, to, uh, pil to have pilgrimage to go Mecca uh, as a journey in, once in your lifetime if you are available financially and health side and uh, to um, give charity, which is a compulsory charity in Islam. Uh, one of my uh, Catholic uh, colleague, uh, who is a priest, once said, the thing I love about Islam the most is that Islam made charity as a compulsory. Because you have to give. You have to give 2.5% of your wealth to the poor, to the needy. These are like five principles of Islam. These are considered practical. And two of them are financial. If you are not financially capable, you don't have to do that. The financial one was, one is charity. If you need charity, you cannot give charity. So basically, you deserve charity in, in such cases. You will be receiving. Uh, and the second one is pilgrimage. If you are financially not capable, you are not required to go to pilgrimage. Again, this is a part of Islamic uh, faith. And the second important uh, aspect of Islam is what we call six articles of faith. And that is to believe in one God, one God only, to be worshipped. For this reason, in the, uh, 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 probably uh, uh, Middle Ages, when uh, Orientalists were talking about Muslims, they would say Mohammedans or Mohammedanism. This is considered offensive for Muslims because it indicates that Muslims worship Muhammad. It's absolutely wrong because Muslims do not worship Muhammad. Muhammad is a worshiper of God. He cannot be worshipped. In fact, no anyone other than God can be worshipped. Angels cannot be worshipped. None can be worshipped except God. So worship is only to God in the Islamic teaching. All messengers of God. Uh, Muhammad, Jesus, Moses, were all worshipping God. They are the best worshippers, but not to be worshipped. So that's very important. Tawheed, T-A-W-H-I-D, the oneness of God is very, very important element of Islam. The first article of faith, in fact. The second is to believe in God's angels. Angels are real creatures in the Islamic teaching. And um, they are not superficial, in fact. We have angels, according to the Islamic teaching. Uh, one is on our uh, um, right shoulder. The other one is on our left shoulder. And the one who is on right shoulder is uh, writing good things. The one that's on left shoulder writing bad things. So always we need to increase the job of the right shoulder angel to do good deeds, basically. Um, there are many. Uh, you, you cannot have their numbers. They are innumerable. We cannot actually number angels. And they are real. Arch uh, there are four archangels. Uh, one is angel Gabriel. The other, one, the other one is angel Azrael, the angel of death. And the third one is angel Israfil, which is uh, uh, responsible for blowing in the trumpet at the end of time. And uh, angel Michael or Mikael in the Islamic uh, uh, teaching, uh, again, who is responsible for the irrigation of the planet. So any green things, uh, thing is related to angel Mikael or Michael. 
So the second article of faith, the third article of faith is to believe in the divine scriptures. So basically, Muslims have to believe in the Quran, which is the final revelation of God according to the Islamic teaching. They have to believe in the scriptures prior to the Quran, and basically to believe in the uh, Torah as the divine message, to believe in the gospel, with, uh, be, uh, in fact, uh, not plural form, one gospel that Muslims speak of it, uh, so, and to believe also in the Psalms, uh, which was revealed to uh, David. In fact, when Muslims teach their children at a very young age, they say, we believe in four divine books, great books. They are called great books in the Islamic teaching. Uh, uh, the Torah revealed to Moses, the Psalms revealed to David, the Gospel revealed to Jesus, and the Quran, the final revelation, revealed to Muhammad by God. So basically, the third uh, article of faith is uh, uh, believe, uh, to believe in the scriptures and then to believe in the messengers of God, prophets of God. And that's why uh, Muslims believe in uh, all messengers of God as a general statement. We believe in all messengers of God. Uh, there are 25 of these prophets namely mentioned in the Quran. So for example, uh, for Muslims, uh, uh, Suleiman or Solomon is a messenger of God. Uh, David is a messenger of God. Um, Moses is a, a prominent messenger of God. In fact, one of the sayings of the prophet suggests that there have been 124,000 prophets before Muhammad came. All of them are true messengers of God. All of them re uh, reveal to humanity convey to, the, to humanity the divine message that God sent to them. So basically, uh, five of these messengers are considered the elite prophets, the highest of 124,000. And these are uh, Moses, Noah, uh, Jesus, Abraham, and Muhammad. These five prophets are considered the highest of all of them. So when Muslims speak of Jesus as the messenger of God, as the prophet of God, it's a very powerful statement. It's not, you know, like prophet that we use in English sometimes, anyone who speaks about future. Uh, prophethood is very profound concept in the Islamic teaching, very profound concept. Not anyone can be a prophet. It's chosen by God. And basically, uh, it's a, a revealed uh, revelation came to this per personality. He is meeting with Angel Gabriel. So basically, it's a very profound uh, term, the concept of prophethood in Islam. And uh, the, um, the fifth article of faith is to believe in the afterlife. So there is a life after this life. Muslims believe that there is a life uh, after this life. Uh, we are here to gain the eternity. That's the purpose of life, to, to actually spend a little time here. Uh, Prophet of Islam says, my story is like a traveler who takes a little rest under the shade of a tree and then goes on on his trip. That is my story, Prophet Muhammad says. Peace and blessings be upon him. So basically, people are in this world to attain, to gain the afterlife. Through what? Through faith, through grace, through good deeds, and you know, through all positive things that they would prefer on this planet. And uh, the final one, uh, which is among Muslim theologians uh, also debated, to believe in the divine plan, that there is a destiny, there is a plan of God, and Muslims have to believe in that. Although Muslims believe in the free will of human being as well, but they believe that the divine will is encompassing. Our free will is within the concept of the divine will. So I think my 10 minutes are finished, right? Is that right? So uh, basically, these are the points that I like to make. Um, and we will have more probably after this. Thank you very much.
thanks for giving us an easy task. Summarize Islam in 10 minutes. Summarize Christianity in 10 minutes. <laughs> Summarize the meaning of life in 10 minutes. <laughs> well, obviously, Christianity is about Christ. And the first thing about Christ is that he was a Jew, and therefore he believed in the God of Abraham, which is the same God that Muslims believe in. If you look at the 99 names of Allah in the Quran, including the 100th name, which is silent and uh, unpronounceable, uh, you find that they are all in the Christian scriptures as well. Uh, since we worship the same God, we are like soldiers on a battlefield with the same commanding officer, or like players in an orchestra uh, trying to obey the same conductor. As human soldiers, we are fallible and imperfect. As uh, players in the orchestra, we make mistakes, but our intention, our spirit, our heart, our love uh, goes to the same ultimate object. What Christians believe about Jesus that distinguishes them, that makes them Christians and not anything else, is that Jesus is, first of all, the Messiah, the one uh, promised to the Jews uh, to establish the kingdom of God. Uh, the Quran agrees with that, by the way. But also that he is the Lord. Uh, the earliest Christian creed is a, a three-word formula in uh, the New Testament. Jesus is kurios, a Greek word meaning Lord, and it's not used for human lords. So we believe that Jesus is divine as well as human. Uh, only Christians believe that. If anyone believes that, that makes them a Christian. And if you don't believe that, that makes you not a Christian. So that's the, the great divide. However, Muslims, as uh, Zeki pointed out, have a very high regard for Jesus. Uh, he is a prophet. He speaks the word of God. Uh, and what Muslims believe about the Quran, which is the center of Islam, is in some ways strikingly similar to what Christians believe about Jesus, namely that it's both heavenly and earthly at the same time. That there is one Quran, but that there is the heavenly Quran and the earthly Quran, which is the same. Now, Jesus is not a book and the Quran is not a person, but we believe that Jesus has two natures, human and divine, although he is only one person. And therefore, if we believe that about him, then he is the Lord, not just objectively, but subjectively, not just theologically, but psychologically, not just the Lord of creation, but the Lord of our lives. And therefore, the, uh, the essence of Christianity is a kind of total surrender or submission or Islam uh, to the one God in Christ. Now, Muslims have at the heart of their religion exactly the same aspiration or desire or will, namely, to totally surrender to, to totally conform to, to totally submit the heart and the life to the one true God. So even though our ways are different, Jesus says, I am the way, yet our ends are identical. We also believe that Jesus is the savior. That's the meaning of the word Jesus. Jesus saves us from sin. Sin is not just things that we do. Sin is a broken relationship with God. Uh, we believe that Jesus comes to restore that relationship. Finally, what we believe about ourselves and the meaning of our lives is strikingly similar. First of all, we believe that God created us to be saints, to be holy. 
That's the ultimate end of our, our lives. Not, not just to live, but to live for something. Uh, not just to be a person, but to be a good person. And the meaning of holiness, I think, is strikingly similar for Christians and Muslims in that it has both natural and supernatural virtues. Uh, the natural moral law known by reason and conscience, uh, known by everyone, since we're all creatures of the one creator, require us to practice justice and courage and self-control uh, and wisdom. And the supernatural virtues, which connect us to the one God, uh, require faith, hope, and charity, the three greatest things in the world. Faith begins in intellectual belief, believing that God has revealed himself, uh, but it centers in a personal trust, in a, uh, a something more than intellectual belief. James in the New Testament says, do you believe that there is one God? Oh, good for you. The devils also believe that and shake with fear. Uh, so this is our first connection with God, our first glue to, to God. And, and the next one is hope. Hope in God's promises. Hope in God's fulfillment of his promises. Hope in life after death. Hope for heaven. Uh, we believe that this earth is like, like a large womb and the purpose is to have a good birth. And when we die, we'll look back on this little 13.7 billion light year universe as little more than a womb, I think, uh, compared with, with heaven. And then finally, the culmination of life is charity. Uh, Jesus taught that the two great commandments summarize the entire law, the entire will of God to love God with your whole heart, your whole soul, your whole mind, and your whole strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Uh, in that is the teaching of all the prophets. We have differences, but the differences are inevitable. Uh, as our first introducer pointed out, this is not a debate about our differences or an attempt to resolve our differences and produce some sort of amalgam or one world religion that's simply unrealistic and ununworkable, uh, but to listen to each other and to learn from each other. And, and I'm very excited about tonight because I want to learn more about God and more about our relationship to God and more about prayer and more about Islam, both as a great world religion and as a practice, because this total surrender or submission of ourselves to the one God is the only sane thing in human life. Sanity is simply conforming to reality. And if you know who God is, the only possible relationship to him is a total surrender. So uh, I would like to, uh, for a very selfish reason, to hear more about that surrender because it is the meaning also of my life. Thank you both for a wonderful explication of each of your uh, perspective faiths. Um, the impetus uh, for this whole event was my reading Dr. Crave's book, uh, Between uh, Allah and Jesus, What Christians Can Learn from Muslims. I thought that would be a great premise for a dialogue. So you have each given us the outlines of, of your faiths. Would you now tell us how that faith comes to be embodied in your life, maybe speaking of when um, there comes a, a point in time in everyone's life when, when you begin to own the faith you grew up with. So what, what difference does all that make in, in your morality, in your ethics, in your social responsibility? And then what have you learned from Christianity or from Islam uh, that has helped you uh, along that way? 
In fact, when we read the holy book of Islam, the Quran, uh, it gives us a um, variety of instructions, uh, both socially and spiritually. In many Quranic verses, I would say probably over uh, 500 verses of the Quran, as you know, the Quran has more than um, 6,000 verses. About maybe 500 verses uh, speaks of faith. And immediately after faith, it says, وَعَمِلُوا salihat," which means, and do good deeds. So faith is good, is, is wonderful, but should be completed with good actions. If you say, I love orphans, and when you see an, an orphan, you escape, instead of taking care of an orphan, that means that, you know, love is not love, actually. That faith that you say is, in fact, not effective. Maybe still, it, there is a, a kind of uh, light of it, but it is very weak. That's why in the Islamic teaching, when we say faith, um, there are thousands of levels of faith. If we make an analogy like a light, you know, imagine a small bulb that has only one watt of light, and then a bulb that has 100,000 watts. Both are considered light, but one is so little, the other one is so high. So basically, faith should be strong, and when you have strong faith, uh, your action uh, comes after that. Your actions will be compatible with faith. And that's why the Quran strongly encourages, encourages to do good actions. Then it reminds you of your responsibilities, social responsibilities. Uh, like uh, um, Peter mentioned, uh, you know, the story of Jesus when he speaks of your neighbor, love your neighbor. In the same way, Prophet Muhammad says, if um, your stomach is full and your neighbor is hungry, you are not considered a member of my community. First of all, you have to share your food with your neighbors. It's uh, in the Islamic tradition, we have uh, stories that Prophet Muhammad would ask his wife, uh, every day, did you share our food with our Jewish neighbor? It was a tradition, Islam uh, made this as a compulsory. In fact, uh, he says, Angel Gabriel came to me and so much encouraged about taking care of my neighbor. Eventually, I thought that my neighbor will be able to be an inheritor of my uh, uh, legacy, of my uh, um, property after I die. So that such a command didn't come, but Prophet Muhammad was expecting something like that even, that God will command him to do something like that for the neighbors. So it's so important. And therefore, social uh, activities is a part of Islamic faith. In fact, it shows that how you are uh, strongly believing in the principles uh, of, of the tradition. So I think just a few words. Christianity too, insists on combining faith and love. Love is not primarily a feeling. Love is primarily a deed, a choice, the works of love. Uh, Christians differ, or at least they used to differ, uh, more sharply than they now do about the relation between these two things. The Protestant Reformation began largely because Luther disagreed with the Catholic Church about salvation, about how to be saved. Uh, and the traditional presentation of that difference is that Luther said you are saved by faith alone, and the Catholic Church said you are saved by faith plus good works. As a student at Calvin College, I was a little suspicious of that, and I said, that's, that's a little too simple. But 
only later did I realize that both sides, as I just defined them, are presented much too simplistically, because faith and love are really ultimately the same reality, namely the very proof of God's spirit in us. If you begin by surrendering to God in faith, then inevitably that is going to produce love, not just by your human reaction, but by the, the reality of what is there. It's like when a, a, a wife surrenders to her husband and gets pregnant, the result is a baby. It's, it's, a, it's a causal process. So it's not that there are two different things. First comes faith and then comes love. It's that there's one thing. It sort of comes, comes in one end and out the other. Uh, so the very first requirement in order to produce the works of love is this surrender, this trust, this Islam. But the whole purpose of that is to produce the works of love. It's, it's like a plant. If you don't have the roots, nothing else in the plant will follow, and the roots are like faith. But the whole point of the plant is to produce the fruit, which is the, the edible thing, or the flower, which is the beautiful thing. So I think we, we, we both see the same truth in somewhat different words. And I think Protestants and Catholics have also understood each other much better in the last few years on that issue, because the, uh, the joint statement on justification uh, has made more progress, I think, in ecumenism among Christians than, than anything in Christian history. It is said that uh, uh, we're saying essentially the same thing in, in different language systems. So much so that one uh, Protestant theologian, Mark Knoll, has said, the Reformation is over. It's a bit of an exaggeration, but uh, great progress has been made there. Uh, and those are two examples, Christians and Muslims listening to each other and Protestants and Catholics listening to each other, of a very simple educational process which, which works by simple, humble listening. Instead of clever theologians trying to figure out how to deal with differences and going into endless debates, we simply want to listen and learn from each other. And that desire, I think, God honors marvelously. I think he's doing that today. Just a few words on um, the concept of love. Uh, I have been thinking of uh, this concept in Christianity, as you know, uh, you, you may f find sometimes uh, writings, God loves everybody. Um, I have been thinking of, of this, in fact, personally, because in the Quran, it's very clear God doesn't love everybody. Uh, because the Quran says, for example, God doesn't love the arrogant. Very clear. In Allah, la yuhibbu kulla muhtalin athim. The sinner, the arrogant, God doesn't love. God doesn't love such a person. So, what is the counterpart of this in Islam? I try to find out. Uh, that, from Islamic theological perspective, I found out that the concept of love that we have in Christianity, uh, in Islam, is called mercy. God has mercy for everybody, be believers, believers or non-believers. For example. Through the mercy of God, uh, someone who do not believe in God also get fresh air. It's a divine gift. Fresh air is a divine gift. God does not distinguish between a believer. Well, you are, you are a believer. You will get fresh air, but the other one is non-believer. I will not give him. Or water. God gives water to everybody. Uh, whatever, you know, the sustenance, the, the fruits, the food. Uh, anything that we see in this planet, uh, both believers and non-believers are all benefiting. So we disregard God has mercy for everybody. I think love in Islam is much more special and it has something to do with, please, with being pleased with something. So when you say, you know, like I love someone, that means you are pleased with this person in the Islamic teaching and therefore God is not pleased with the actions of some people like criminals god is not pleased with their actions so god basically does not love their actions but still god have mercy uh, uh, for those people 
God's mercy is uh, continuing for all those people. So one thing, it was on my mind uh, for a long time. So I finally, I solved the problem in my <laughs> I think most Christians think that in the Quran, Allah is described as just more often than merciful. Uh, could you correct that? How often is he described as merciful? That's, yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you, uh, Peter. Uh, in fact, that's one understanding uh, that we actually we have few knowledge about it. Uh, one theme that we have few knowledge about it. And the concept of mercy in Islam is so profound. Um, Quran has 114 chapters. In the beginning of each chapter, one chapter is exception because one chapter is considered the continuation of the other chapter. So on that one, that is exception. Let's say in the beginning of 113 chapters of the Quran, the divine name, the most merciful, is repeated. Uh, Al-Rahim, Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, in the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. 113 times repeated. And separately, within the Quranic verses, maybe uh, 700 times. I, uh, you know, I don't have statistics in front of me, but it's very frequently repeated. So basically, uh, justice and love, justice and mercy in Islam are completing each other. M mercy should not be an obstacle to justice in the Islamic teaching. For example, uh, when judge uh, has found a criminal and the criminal comes to him, he would say, well, I am very merciful. I should forgive this criminal. Uh, Islamic tradition says justice should be applied. That mercy at that case is not appropriate because justice should be applied. You, if you forgive individually, you are allowed to forgive. Yes, let's say somebody did some negative actions against you. The Quran says um, retaliation is possible, but forgiveness Retaliation is actually negative. Forgiveness is better. If you have such a case in front of a, just, a, a, a judge, then judge should not show compassion because judge is a in a position to fulfill the law and therefore law should be uh, applied. So in the Quranic language, I would say uh, the merciful name of God, the divine name, the most merciful, is much more repeated than the divine name, Al-Adil, which means the just. And in fact, there is a saying related to the divine, which is in the Islamic teaching known as hadith, but uh, uh, holy hadith that uh, Prophet Muhammad narrates from God, which is different than the Quran, uh, is lower with regard to the uh, uh, soundness of the narration. Uh, God says, my mercy, has overcome my wrath. My mercy is more. That's why in the Islamic teaching, uh, uh, the number of the gates of heaven, paradise, are eight. The number of the gates of hell are seven. So the number of the gates of hell uh, is lower than the number of the gates of heaven because more people God wants to be in heaven in the Islamic understanding. Would, would you not agree that justice and mercy imply each other? Because unless there is a rule of justice, mercy is meaningless. Unless you deserve to be punished, it's not merciful to uh, take back the punishment. And in another sense, mercy is prior to justice because we are God's creatures. Uh, and we did not exist before we were created, so we could not possibly justly deserve to exist. So it was pure mercy that established our existence and our justice. That's, uh, yeah, very good. Now, it's, uh, it, we <laughs> turn in a different, st <laughs> different uh, style, but it's perfectly fine. Um, I think I agree with that, you know, from Islamic theological perspective. Um, the concept of uh, uh, justice and mercy from the divine perspective is absolutely right, as Peter said. Because um, 
for our very existence, we are indebted to God for our very existence. Um, we, in fact, uh, Islamic theologians would say, uh, we have received our reward already. Because what we do as prayers, uh, uh, you know, all these beautiful things that we, have, we are doing is basically uh, unable to bring a paradise for us. Uh, paradise is a merely a divine gift for human, uh, human beings. So all these things that we have uh, is uh, a part of the divine mercy, the divine, uh, um, uh, the divine compassion uh, for human beings. And that's why um, we have a story narrated in the Islamic uh, uh, tradition. Uh, in fact, it narrates from the early, uh, uh, you know, prior to Islam, prior uh, traditions, that uh, one person uh, would have his prayers in a cave for 40 years. And um, Moses is narrated to Moses. Moses, uh, when he wanted to go to uh, Mount Sinai to speak to God, he, Moses asked him, um, I'm going to talk to God. Do you have any message for God? You know, do you want anything from God? And he says, well, I have been worshiping for 40 years. So just ask God to give my reward, and that's it. The reward of my prayer. And Moses tells this to God. This story, of course, may not be in a real sense, but Muslims make a sense of it, basically. They use this as an evidence of the divine mercy. Uh, God says to Moses, he says, tell to my servant in the cave that I have compared his 40 years of prayer to the two eyes that I have given him, he still indebted me. So basically he needs to do 40 more years just in order to fulfill the reward that I gave him as two eyes, just eyes, two eyes that we have, we see, the sight that God has given to human beings. So basically, you are unable to finish the divine gifts. Your prayers are not enough to fulfill all these divine gifts. So what you do, you say, Lord, I am doing these prayers for this limited period of time. If you have given me one billion years of life, I would have done the same. So because of this beautiful intention, God says, I will give you as you have lived billion years. So therefore, you will be eternally in the eternal paradise because of this beautiful intention. Intention is essential in the Islamic teaching. So, Zeki, when you die and you face the last judgment, uh, is your hope for paradise based on Allah's mercy or his justice? Mercy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely well, mercy. Because in Islam, it is absolutely God is the most just. But as human beings, we are not uh, uh, in a position to ask, well, Lord, we have done the best, so uh, you, you have to give us. There is no such thing in Islam that God is required to do something. God is not required. God is merciful and actually deals with human beings with his mercy. If uh, There is a verse in the Quran. It says God never, never uh, do wrongs to any uh, uh, God never does wrong to any creature, any human beings. Whatever God does is just. But for uh, human beings, basically, we cannot ask, you know, as a reward for our actions and say, well, Lord, just give the reward of my actions and that's it. I am done. Always we ask for more forgiveness and more mercy. Thank you. The distinctive creation teaching of Christianity about Jesus, which seems to distance us from Islam, uh, in another way unites us because in Christianity, Jesus is more than just a prophet. He is the incarnation of, of God. And one of Paul's letters, uh, Colossians, says that uh, in effect, if you want to know God, look at Jesus. This, this, 
that's all there is. There ain't no more. That's the complete final revelation of God. Well, Jesus is pure mercy. Uh, if you look at him as, as a, a sign, as something you look along instead of just look at, uh, as an icon, as, a, as an image, as a, a symbol, as a, a beam of light. You can look at a beam of light or you can look along the beam of light and see what's illuminated by it. His claim is that he reveals uh, the nature of God. Uh, and his entire life is mercy. I think we've uh, established some several general areas of uh, broad agreement uh, and, and uh, similarity. I hear uh, a commonality of the need to uh, submit to God because God is love, God is mercy. Uh, and it is through mercy that we go to heaven. Uh, I did have a, a couple more questions for our moderated discussion, but I already received questions that were texted in, so a reminder, if you want to ask questions, you can text them, or if you need a note card, just raise your hand and someone will come by. Uh, the first question I received, though, uh, was about heaven, and it's asking for some, uh, maybe a bit of uh, a difference here. The question is, do both, uh, do both Muslims and Christians go to heaven? Along with that, um, can you ex answer that, but then also expand a little bit more about what heaven is in each tradition and, and what we might learn from the other tradition about God from our concepts of heaven? Well, if there's two countries that are at war, and each is trying to capture prisoners from the other country. Uh, let's say America and Germany are at war. All right, America wants to get German prisoners of war out of Germany into American prisoner of war camps. And Germany wants to get American prisoners out of American territories in the German prisoner of war camps. So if you have two different leaders, if you have, let's say, Roosevelt versus Hitler, then their goals are to put their captives into opposite places. If, on the other hand, Muslims and Christians worship the same God, although in different ways and by different means and they have significant differences, but if, if there's just one commanding officer, then he wants to put as many of us as possible in his heaven. So, despite our battles here on earth, uh, our common creator wants as many as possible of his children to go to heaven. So the answer to that question has to be yes, because of the one God. Yes, the answer is yes. Um, you know, in the Islamic uh, teaching, um, Muslims are very careful to make judgment on behalf of God. Uh, they can just say some general, you know, statements. For example, um, for a Muslim, if you ask a Muslim, are you going to heaven? He would say, well, I hope, but God knows. Because there is no guarantee. In Islam, there is no guarantee. You may uh, go astray at the very moment. And therefore, always, you have to be hopeful and also very careful. Careful of what? Possibly you may lose. Because you have been given, uh, as Peter mentioned, uh, to be a saint. You have this capacity. In fact, every human being, regardless of their nationalities, regardless of their uh, ethnicities, they have the capacity to become a saint, to become a divine uh, you know, like a person who is beloved by the divine. But they can lose at the same time. And therefore, it's, uh, some Islamic scholars uh, compare this to a seed. When you put uh, a seed underground, this seed has capacity to grow and become a tree and give fruits. But if you don't give it water, soil, warmness, the sun, the, the light, the heat, then this seed will be rotten and die. Basically, will die. And therefore, it will be nothing. 
every human being is like such a seed. And it can develop and become a wonderful tree, wonderful tree in paradise through this uh, uh, process that the prophets have chosen. The prophets have mentioned this. So the Quran speaks of uh, uh, Muslims. Uh, if you do, it speaks of three conditions to go to paradise, to believe in God, these conditions, uh, to believe in God first, to believe in the afterlife, and to do good deeds. So basically, the Quran says, be, uh, I think chapter 2, verse 62, if you have time, you can look at this Quranic verse. Be a Muslim, or a Christian, or a Jewish, or a Sabi'in, if you uh, believe in God, and believe in the afterlife, and do good deeds, you will be rewarded in the afterlife. You will be in paradise. Some Muslim scholars interpret this. They say, in fact, if you believe, really, if you believe in God, you have to believe in Prophet Muhammad as well. Because it is so much unique. It is so much, you know, like a mercy of God. As just Peter said, Jesus is a mercy of God. In the Quranic language, Prophet Muhammad is a mercy for the entire universe. Rahmatan lil alamin. For the universes, not only one universe. Prophet Muhammad's description in the Quran. So basically, they would say, yes, if you believe really in God, you will believe in Prophet Muhammad as well, properly. They would say, but the Quranic verse is very clear that if you have these three conditions, God willing, you will be among the people of paradise. Again, for a Muslim even, there is no guarantee. I am a Muslim, so I guarantee I am going to paradise. No such easy thing and such a uh, cheap way to go into paradise. It's really, you need to be very hardworking. Uh, Muslims would make some comments on this. In order to have a wonderful palace in this planet, how much of work do you need to do? So paradise also is not cheap in the Islamic teaching. You have to work very hard. You have to make some sacrifices. Uh, from your probably properties, giving charity, from your uh, time, spending some time in the way of the divine, doing prayers. You will do all your jobs, and then you will say, Lord, I have done my best, but I know that with this I do not deserve it. Still, I need your mercy. But these are some good signs that I am having a good intention to receive your mercy. And I think with this, you are very hopeful, very hopeful, because there is a statement in the Quran It says, only disbelievers become hopeless of the divine mercy. A believer in the Quranic language cannot be hopeless. Only disbelievers can be hopeless of the divine mercy. So always there is a hope. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, one, uh, one of the statements of the prophet suggests that uh, a person uh, once uh, uh, um, speaks uh, of his sin as like big as mountains. And the prophet says, even this person should not be hopeless. That God is the most forgiving. Al-Ghaffar, one of the divine names, the most forgiving. God may forgive, so do not be hopeless. Just do your best. There are two alternatives to hope, presumption and despair. Uh, evil usually comes in opposite forms, whereas good is, is one. Uh, many Christians today, I think, are very presumptuous because they assume that everyone or nearly everyone is going to heaven. Uh, if there's any one doctrine in Christianity that's unpopular nowadays, it's certainly the doctrine of hell. But if everyone goes to heaven, then Jesus was a very bad teacher because he warned repeatedly about hell. Uh, he also didn't satisfy our curiosity about numbers. When the disciples asked him, Lord, are many going to be saved? They probably thought, let's get the information from him before he goes away. Uh, <laughs> the comparative population statistics of heaven and hell, please. Uh, and his answer to that, like his answers to most questions, was essentially, you're asking the wrong question. 
So he answered the right question, which they should have asked instead. He And that brings us uh, straight to Jesus. Uh, our second question, and I'm going to add one. So the, the second question is for uh, Dr. Saratoprek. Uh, and then, and that question is, how can, Jesus be, how can Jesus be the great prophet when he claims to be the son of God? And I'd like to, to reverse that sort of uh, to Dr. Kraft. Uh, what, what can Christians make of the Muslim claim that Muhammad is a prophet of God? Uh, in the, uh, let me respond to this from theological methodology uh, uh, of Islam. When there is a statement by such a prominent messenger of God, let's say Jesus, Jesus says, I am the son of God. Let's say Jesus said it. Uh, or Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon all of the messenger of God. Uh, Muhammad uh, uh, said, I am the son of God. What will be Muslims' response to this, theologically speaking? First of all, um, Muslims believe that Jesus doesn't lie. If Jesus says, it is accurate, it is correct. Because Jesus is a messenger of God, trusted by God, given the gospel, the holy book, that the Quran refers to it as a holy text of the divine. So. Jesus doesn't lie. Jesus says the truth. Did Jesus say it? That is the problem. So let's search because apparently this is contradicting the major principle of the Quran that God doesn't have children. The Quran says God does not beget and God is not begotten. So God doesn't have children. Allegorically, may people say all human beings are the children of God. That means the creatures of God. If that is the case, it's acceptable. But to say a person, individual, as the son of God will be contradicting what the Quran says. So basically, they would say, let's search, do a research on this, and see if really Jesus has said this. We made a huge research and found out that really Jesus said this. Then Muslim commentators would say, uh, theologians would say, so what is the word son in the original language? Let's say Jesus, what language Jesus was talking about? Talking, uh, uh, in which language Jesus was talking? He was talking in Aramaic language. Okay, what is the word for son in Aramaic language? Well, is it Ibn? Is it Ab? Or is it something else? Then they will have etymological aspects of this word. And they will say, what is meant by this word in the common language of the Aramaic people of the time? Would someone when use, I am the son of something, does mean that he is the beloved of that person? In this case, they will interpret that, well, Jesus was accurate when he said he meant that I am the beloved of God. Not son, not literally, but allegorically, I am the beloved of God. And if this is the case, then Muslims will say we have no problem with this. Because it is not contradicted with the Quran. When Jesus says, I am the beloved of God, perfectly, Quran would suggest that. Because the Quran says, Jesus is the beloved of God. He's the Messiah in the Quranic language. So basically, this is not only for Jesus, it's for Moses, for Muhammad, anyone. When there is something that is contradicting what the Quranic uh, principles have, then they will interpret. Interpret uh, in a way to make it possible. Even, let's say, with all these possibilities, we couldn't find a way to find a solution, then Muslims would say, Jesus was right, but we don't understand him. Still, we don't understand him because we haven't found what he meant by this. I think Christians would say something similar about Muhammad. There's a similar problem. Muhammad claims to be the last and final prophet. And yet, it certainly seems that the Quran contradicts 
the teachings of Jesus uh, about who Jesus is. Is he the son of God? The Quran claims to correct the Jewish and Christian scriptures uh, and claims that what we have today are not the original books that God revealed, which are infallible, but books which came, became corrupt over time and errors crept into them. Uh, so the question for a Christian is about Muhammad, just as the question about a Muslim is about Jesus. Muhammad claims to be a prophet. A prophet speaks the truth. A prophet is not just a, a, a human philosopher who might make errors. A prophet doesn't speak his own opinions, but communicates the mind of God. The claim that Muhammad makes is that these words were given to him by the angel Gabriel from God. And he is, like most prophets in our Bible, reluctant even reluctant to, to admit and, and to believe at first because he, he, he thought he was insane. But he had to believe. All right, so that has the, uh, the marks of a prophetic call about it. Now that's either true or it isn't. Uh, the initial problem that I think a Christian would have with that is, well, if it is true, then Islam is the final religion. And if it isn't true, then Muhammad is not even a prophet because he lied about where he got these words from. Because if these words aren't true, then they're not from God. Uh, and yet, if they're not from God, then either they're from his own pride uh, and he's, he's deliberately lying, or even worse, from, from demonic inspiration. But if you look at the Quran and judge it by, by Christian standards, uh, it's a very holy book. 99% uh, of it agrees with the Bible. So if that's from the devil, the devil is certainly <laughs> compromising his own principles. He's, he's, he has to uh, admit a lot of good in order to uh, have a little bit of error. Uh, Muhammad's theology is a very high and holy monotheism which combated the pagan polytheism of his time. His morality is a very high and holy morality, which, which combated the, uh, the selfish tribal violence of his time. Uh, and, and if all that only came from Muhammad and not from God, then Muhammad is certainly the greatest human philosopher in the history of the world. Because who, who by merely human reason ever arrived at a very high and holy concept of God and morality? Well, I would say as a historian, a philosopher, probably Aristotle came the closest. But if you count the 99 names of God in the Quran, and you look at the concept of God in Aristotle's philosophy, he got nine of the 99. That's pretty good, that's 10%. Maybe nobody else got more than 5%, but that's still not very much. So. If, if Muhammad is only a philosopher, he's an amazing philosopher. That can't be. All right. Well, then, if he's neither a mere philosopher, nor is, nor is he inspired by the devil, nor is he a deliberate liar, what could he possibly be by Christian standards other than exactly what Muslims say he is, namely the final and infallible prophet? Well, I think that the most reasonable answer to that is that he is a mystic who received indeed divine revelations uh, either indirectly through Jews and Christians that he met or else directly through perhaps an angel. Uh, many Christian saints receive divine revelations, private revelations from God and they are indeed from God and these are very holy people but they often contradict each other. How can that be, since God never contradicts himself? Well, they're, they're mixed with human interpretation or misinterpretation. If Muhammad is anything less than an infallible prophet, he could be a holy human being who actually received messages from God but misinterpreted them. Now, that's certainly not the Muslim take on Muhammad. That's taking him down a peg.
peg. But very similarly, the Muslim take on Jesus takes him down a peg from son of God to simply a prophet. So I think we have a quid pro quo here. Um, one, one of the key aspects of the Christian faith is that we are broken, we are fallen, we are sinful. There is a broken relationship between God and us. And Jesus comes to fix that. So I have one more question for each of you and for uh, uh, Dr. Sarah Toprek, the, yours is, uh, is there a similar aspect to that relationship in Islam? Is, our, is the human relationship broken with God? And if so, how is it restored? And then I'll have a, another question for Dr. Kraft. In the uh, Islamic teaching, uh, there is um, no concept of original sin. Um, they, you know, like the father, the parents of humanity, let's say Adam and Eve, uh, made a mistake, committed sin in paradise, but God forgave that sin, and that's it. It's forgiven. So basically, uh, there is no uh, transmission of the sin of an, uh, you know, like an ancestor to the offspring. We are not guilty because, because of the, uh, uh, Adam's uh, mistake, the sin that he, uh, he committed. This is like a principle in Islam because very, clear, uh, very clearly in the Quran, it is stated that Adam and Eve both were forgiven. God forgave them. And in fact, even Adam is known as the first prophet in Islam, became the prophet of God. Um, and they, were, they had a mistake together, by the way, not only Eve committed first and then Adam. They, the Quran says they committed together the same mistake and they were forgiven by the divine. With this, there is one aspect in the human nature that uh, potentially human being is able to commit sin. Human being has the capacity uh, to become an evil person. And also has the capacity to become an angelic person. Basically, uh, we have both sides as human beings. And when we become evil, God forbid, human beings' evilness is greater than other creatures' evil because they have plan. They can do actually and organize and make a huge, huge crime. And that's why the Quran speaks very emphatically about uh, the, the mistakes that human beings may have or the crimes that human beings may commit. Now, who can uh, uh, fix this, uh, this aspect of human being? All prophets of God, <clears throat> Jesus, Moses, Muhammad, uh, Abraham, Noah, Isaac, Ishmael, all these came to guide humanity to the right direction. Satan will always try to deceive people. It's a kind of a divine plan. Why that is the case? Can God, you know, can God just stop Satan? Uh, uh, from deceiving people? Yes, God is all-powerful, can do that. But God wants to test people. Because in Islam, life is a test. Whether you will pass or you will fail. And that is basically, um, for, for who are the teachers of this test? Prophets, messengers of God. They come, they give the directions, they give the instructions, and some people will listen to them using their free will because that's why we have free will, some people will, will not listen to them and they may fail. So, you know, I'm going very, uh, in a very short way to, to explain these very deep issues in Islam. Okay, some people never have heard, have never heard of any prophets. Well, what will be their situation? In Islam, they are among the people of saved because they haven't heard anything. They haven't heard any positive things about the messages of the divine messengers. So they, therefore they are not actually responsible because the Quran clearly says, we cannot, God says, we do not punish 
anyone that has not received the revelation. So basically, there are some people who may have never received the revelation. And um, coming, you know, with, with regard to the human nature, uh, you use your free will. And always when you use your free will, you will say, uh, ask grace from God. Guide me to the right direction. That's why in the uh, five daily prayers, approximately a Muslim who is practicing daily prayers five times a day, daily, 40 times has this prayer. Lord, guide me to the right path. Why? Because it's easy to be on the wrong path. And therefore, you always ask God. 40 times, can you imagine? Every day, a Muslim around the world will ask God for guidance. And then you'll use your free will, and then you'll say, the rest is upon God. I don't, you know, I have done my best, and I am asking the divine grace after this. So basically, the message of, uh, uh, of prophets is to um, convey the divine, uh, uh, the divine message. And that you can, in the Christian tradition, it, it has become known as fixing the broken relationship with God. It's very possible. Daily you, have broken, bro you, can broke your relation, you can break your relationship with God on a daily basis. And then you have to fix it. How you fix it? You make repentance. When you repent, that relationship is fixed. And then you will not do it again. Of course, you have to have good intention that, Lord, I will never do it again. But you are a human being and you are weak. You may do it again. Again, you will fix it with the divine and reconnect yourself with the divine mercy. I want to ask you one question about that. Uh, what is the, the Arabic word for forgetting of God? Gafla, something like that? Gafla, yes. Gafla, yeah. Gafla, basically heedlessness. All right. Did Adam and Eve have that before, the, before they ate the forbidden fruit or only after? They, uh, I think the Quranic verse uses nisyan, which means forget. They mm -hmm. forgot their promise to God. Um, it's a general statement in the, uh, in the Quranic uh, uh, term. It's believed that they, uh, uh, they forgot the divine command that God told them, do not approach these three. And Satan, in the Islamic, in the Quranic narrative, uh, Satan comes and deceives them. Um, this story is very long. Probably many of you might know from the Bible as well. Uh, the God creates Adam first. I will do it in a very short way. Um, then uh, there is one individual among angels, who is not an angel, by the way. In the Islamic teaching, Satan, whose name is Iblis, is not an angel. He's from jinn, which is, you know, in the English, I think we use uh, genie. Uh, something, you know, indicates some invisible creatures. They are created from fire in the Islamic literature. So Satan was one of them. Iblis was one of them. Among angels praying to God. And when God created Adam, uh, God asked all angels to obey before him. And Satan said, I don't do that. I am better than him because you created him from soil and you created me from fire. I, fire is stronger than soil, so I cannot uh, obey Adam. That's why in the Islamic uh, tradition, people, uh, when talk about this, they say Satan or Iblis was the first racist because he used his origin as the source of superiority. I am superior to Adam, he said. Then God said, Adam, this will be your enemy. Be aware of him. He said, I am, Lord, give me permission. I am going to deceive them. Adam and his offspring. And God said, you'll have no power of my pious servants. And he said, I am going to approach them from up, from down, from sides, in order to deceive them. God gave him this chance so that human beings will be tested. That's, you know. The, the story, and actually, he came to Adam and deceived both of them. He said, 
there is a fruit here. If you taste it, you will be eternal in paradise. That's why God asked you not to do that. And they were deceived by Adam's, uh, uh, by Satan's um, uh, instruction, negative instruction. And when they realized that that was Satan instructed them uh, uh, and, and uh, have them made this mistake, they became very uh, uh, sorry and immediately they asked God for forgiveness. And of course, as kind of uh, uh, result, God said, go out of paradise. Go on earth. So they came to earth and they started the beginning of human beings. You know, the narrative is this way, but we have many commentators by Muslim scholars on this. And then they for basically we are coming to the concept of forgetfulness. Insan is a word for human being in the Quranic language. Insan is derivative of nisyan, which means forgetfulness. Human being is actually the name of, very name of it in Arabic is coming from forgetfulness. Human being is forgetful. Today you say something, tomorrow they forget. And therefore you have to remind. And that's why one of the names of the Quran is a dhikr, which means reminder. Every day when you read, it's reminding you. It's really reminding you. And especially when you read carefully, you feel like really it's talking to you. It's giving you a remind, a remind about So that. in like Quranic theology, God created us in this state of forgetfulness. Yes, this was not absolutely. a result of the fall. Yes. And those people who have never heard a prophet, uh, they don't know enough about God from their conscience to be responsible? They, uh, one, there are two, theology, two theologies in Islamic uh, uh, theological literature. Um, one says, because the Quranic verse is very clear, it says, God says, we will never punish any nation without sending them a messenger from us. So if, if people never heard of a messenger from God, they will not be punished. They will be in paradise. Uh, and not only this, children, for example. All children who, who die before the age of puberty, they are people of paradise. They are in paradise. All children. Because they have no capacity to distinguish what is between what's right and what's wrong. And we therefore, um, uh, the people who have uh, um, this uh, uh, mind, brain, uh, in one school of Islamic thought, Maturidi, actually, Al-Maturidi, you might uh, have heard of this school of Islamic thought, uh, one of two majors of schools of Islamic thought says, well, God has given you bra brain, God has given you mind, and therefore you have to use your mind and understand that this universe needs a creator. And therefore, Al-Maturidi school of thought says, if you live in a place that is distant from all things, anything, all civilization. You know, like in the Islamic uh, literature, we have Hay bin Yakzan who lives in an island, or uh, um, uh, uh, Robinson Crusoe, uh, like uh, uh, living in an island, and you never heard of anything uh, about divine. Uh, one school of Islamic thought says, you are excused. You don't have to believe in anything. But Maturity says, because you have brain, God has given you mind, you should contemplate how these stars, how this moon, how this uh, sun is so organized. So you have to find, at least to a certain level, the concept of the creator in this universe. Hmm. Well, Dr. Crave, you complained at the beginning uh, that we asked you to summarize the Christian faith in uh, 10 minutes. So now I'm going to uh, top that. Uh, in ask you one final question, if you could answer it shortly. Uh, one of the key aspects of, of uh, Islam is, of course, that there is one God. Well, how then, and Christians also believe in one God, how can there be three forms of one God? There are not. God, God has no form. He is infinite. 
but he has three persons. One God and three gods is a contradiction. One person and three persons is a contradiction. One God in three persons is a mystery, but not a contradiction. The reason Christians believe in this mystery is basically their scriptures. They're scien Christians are scientific, like, like, like anybody. Anybody can do science. Science is just refined common sense. Science... <laughs> really. Science tests hypotheses by data. Now, believers accept scripture as divinely revealed data. So our scriptures tell us very clearly that there is only one God. Uh, and clearly, this is the being that Jesus calls Father. Jesus also claims to be God, prays to his Father, has a relationship of Islam or surrender or submission of will to his Father, says he will send the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of, of God, which is also divine, so we have apparently contradictory data here. One God, the Father is God, Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God, the Father is a different person than Jesus, the Holy Spirit is a different person than Jesus. How can you reconcile all this data without denying any of the data, if it is all data? Well, that's a little bit like the problem in, in physics, is light undulatory or corpuscular? Is it wave or particle? Uh, that's a little bit like, they, they ask me sometimes how to pronounce my name. Is it, is it creeft or creft? And I say, well, that's like the, the joke about the Englishman and the Irishman arguing about, do you say neither or neither? And the Scotchman settles it by saying, it's neither. <laughs> so so it's, it, it's creeft. So it's neither wave alone nor particle alone, but both. Uh, a similar mystery, puzzle, problem, is uh, the two natures of Jesus, human or divine. Well, to say that Jesus is one person and two persons is a contradiction. To say that he has one nature and two natures is a contradiction. But to say that he has, one, that, that he has two natures in one person is a mystery, but not a contradiction. Because even all of us, in a different way, have two natures. We're both visible and is invisible. We're both mortal through our bodies, and that's us, and immortal through our souls, and that's us. Uh, God's world is full of mysteries. And the higher you go, the more mysterious. So we're not that surprised that there should be Mysteries which seem to amount to contradictions but aren't, the farther you penetrate in, in, into the mind of God. But the ultimate reason why we accept the doctrine of the Trinity is because we can't deny any of the data. Dr. Crafton, Dr. Sarah Toprek, uh, I have learned a great deal both about Islam and my own faith, Christianity, and so I thank you, and now I'd like to ask all of you to join me in thanking our two speakers this evening. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.